through progressive theology, radical welcoming, and social justice. No matter if you grew up in the United Church of Canada or had never set foot in any church before this morning, it's good that you're here. No matter if you come full of optimism and joy or burdened by shame or grief or fear or anger, you are uh, welcome and there is a place for you. No matter if you come seeking answers or only wish to better understand the questions, all God's children of every color of the rainbow are embraced as sacred, treasured, and made in the image of God. My name is Murray Spear. My personal pronouns are he and him, and I'm privileged to be the minister here at Wild Rose United Church. With me in the sanctuary providing leadership uh, this morning are Dan Somerville and Diane McKenzie, Marlene Cole, Linda Ellis, Claude Mathieu, Don McIntosh, uh, Corinne Salajano, and Bill Aiken. We have uh, returned to uh, providing online worship from our partial reopening, so we are a smaller group, again, more like uh, we've been used to in the sanctuary over the past year, um, and uh, we are watching closely to learn when we will be able to safely return to partial reopening. Long before anyone who looked like me came to this continent from Europe or to this place where the bow and the elbow meet called Mokinstis in Blackfoot and Calgary in English, there were people here. People who had fully developed systems of culture and economics and politics and spirituality and who had been here from the beginning. We acknowledge this history. We acknowledge our neighbors in the Treaty 7 First Nations, the Blackfoot Confederacy comprising the Siksika, Kainai, and Pikani First Nations, as well as the Tsutina First Nation and the three nations of the Stony Nakoda, Wesley, Bearspaw, and Chiniki, and also Métis Nation of Alberta. We all have work to do in healing and reconciling the broken relationships of centuries. Uh, a couple of announcements. Um, one is that the annual report is, uh, season is upon us. If you are or may be responsible for an annual report, uh, the deadline for that is January 15th, so you have a couple of weeks from today. Um, if you aren't sure if you're responsible for an annual report, you can check with me or I'm sure with, uh, with Charlie or, uh, or someone else from the board and we can help you figure that out. One of our sung responses this morning includes a Swahili, Swahili portion. This is part of our uh, uh, commitment to becoming an intercultural uh, denomination. And uh, so you'll hear uh, probably Linda singing the Swahili uh, to the best of her ability, but I'm going to tell you what the words sound like when they're written out. Uh, the words are Mungu Nimwema, Mungu Nimwema, Mungu Nimwema, Nimwema, Nimwema. Uh, and that means know that God is good. And that's also the words of the English portion. Now as we prepare our hearts for worship, we'll, share, we'll sing our opening song and our Christ candle will be lit while we sing. Please join me in our call to worship. The yellow portion is for you. The call to worship today is inspired by Psalm 86. And teach me your ways, O Holy One, so that I can walk faithfully with you. Focus my heart toward your faithfulness. I will give you thanks to you, God of all. For you've brought my soul up from the lowest depths, and I will spread the news of your love forever. Amen. We come to worship not to see or hear, but to be seen and heard by God, not to help ourselves, but to seek God's help and be helpful in turn. Let us open our hearts to the saving and renewing presence of the one who is always ready to listen. Let us pray. 
God of light, we read in the scriptures that the mystery of Christ is for the whole world, not a select few. But we also read that the good news of Christ is met not only by wonder and delight, but also by fear and anger. How quick we are to assume that you are just like us. How quick we are to assume that your delight in us is not also accompanied by anger. Too often it is easier to see the sinfulness of others and ignore our own injustices and wrongdoing than to do the hard work of journeying with you. Guide us by your star of peace to find the center of your love and to recognize there all the fear and anger, shame and grief that are holding us back and weighing us down. Help us to offer it up to you in tribute and thus to more faithfully follow your call. Send your abiding love to help us live transformed lives. Peace Candle is a tradition that has spread from congregation to congregation over the past 40 years. This is what we say here when we light the Peace Candle. Peace is characterized not by the absence of conflict, but by the presence of justice. Peace is the state that emerges in our midst when those who have much do not have too much, and those who have little do not have too little, when the very old and the very young feel supported and secure. Parents can feed their children and themselves, and all have the opportunity for meaningful work in their community. Let us pray and work as I light this candle for that kind of peace. And now uh, Dan and Linda will lead us in a hymn.
I wonder if you can see what I'm holding. It's pretty small. Folks in the sanctuary, can you see what I'm holding? It's just a, a little strip of paper from a printer. It's actually a, a, a card, a card uh, stock paper. And it has uh, the colors of the rainbow printed on it. It's actually the same thing that I'm wearing on my collar, so that I have a rainbow collar instead of just plain white. I wonder if you've seen a rainbow outside. It happens in the sky when there's, uh, when there's rain and sun at the same time. Because when there's rain, not all of the water falls to the ground. Some of it stays suspended in the atmosphere. And when the sunlight hits it, it bounces back onto our eyes, but when it bounces back onto our eyes, it's split up into all the different colors. I don't know if you have a favorite color. My favorite color these days is red. I like, I like the red, it's at the top. And it goes all the way down through to purple. I wonder what the rainbow would be like if we took one of the colors away. It's hard for us to imagine, isn't it? Some people don't see all the same colors, but they still see the whole rainbow when they look at it. The story that we're going to hear in a minute from the Bible is, well, I say story, it's actually a, a, a letter written a long time ago by a person named Paul. And Paul was writing to a group of people who were in a fight. They were having an argument with each other. And they all wanted so desperately to be right. They all wanted to win the argument. So they sent a message to Paul. And they said, Paul, you're our teacher. You tell us who is right and who is wrong. And what Paul says back is something very different. He doesn't want to tell them who's right and who's wrong. He doesn't want to support them fighting with each other. He doesn't want them to think that any time there's a disagreement that they should just keep fighting until somebody wins. So he writes back that they are kind of like this. They don't all see things the same. Some of them see things in red. Some of them see things in orange. Some of them some see things in blue. But together, they make so much more. Because the light that turns into the rainbow in the sky is white. It's plain white light from the sun. It's all one. And we get to see the different parts of it split out in the rainbow. But that doesn't mean that they're separate. Paul says the most important thing when you're having a fight, when you've been split out into people who see things differently or who think differently. The most important thing is to remember that you all belong together and that winning the fight is so much less important than staying together and caring for each other. And I think even though Paul wrote that letter a long, long, long time ago, it's still a message that we all need to hear. Thank you so much for listening today. Uh, Claude is going to read our scripture. Our scripture this morning is from the book of Corinthians 1, 
chapter 1, verses 10 to 31. Now I encourage you, beloved family, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, agree with each other and don't be divided into rival groups. Instead, be restored with the same mind and the same purpose. My beloved family, Chloe's people gave me some information about you that you're fighting with each other. What I mean is this, that each one of you says, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos, I belong to Cephas, I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you or were you baptized in Paul's name? Thank God that I didn't baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius so that nobody can say that you were baptized in my name. Oh, I baptized the house of Stephanus too. Otherwise, I don't know that I baptized anyone else. Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news. And Christ didn't send me to preach the good news with clever words so that Christ's cross won't be emptied of its meaning. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are being destroyed. But it is the power of God for those of us who are being saved. It is written in scripture, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and I will reject the intelligence of the intelligent. Where are the wise? Where are the legal experts? Where are today's debaters? Hasn't God made the wisdom of the world foolish? In all wisdom, God determined that the world wouldn't come to know God through its wisdom. Instead, God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of preaching. Jews ask for sign, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, which is a scandal to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks. Christ is God's power and God's wisdom. This is because the foolishness of God is wiser than the human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Look at your situation when you were called, beloved family. By ordinary human standards, not many were wise, not many were powerful, not many were from the upper class. But God chose what the world considers foolish to shame the wise. God chose what the world considers weak to shame the strong. And God chose what the world considers low class and low life, what is considered to be nothing, to reduce what is considered to be something to nothing. So no human being can brag in God's presence. It is because of God that you are in Christ Jesus, who became wisdom from God for us. This means that Christ made us righteous and holy and delivered us. This is consistent with what was written. The one who brags should brag in the Lord. God offers us words of life, the living word. Amen. I've always known the power of words. the power to create connections, the power to sustain ideas forever, in some cases, in print, the power to convince, I remember testing the limits of words. 
when I was quite young, I would try to use words to get my way. To try to get what I wanted. Whether I was telling the truth or not, I tested my ability. Because I wanted to be comfortable. I wanted to be content. I wanted to be safe, and so I would see what was possible in terms of getting what I wanted from other people. I'm sure we all know somebody who has made a lifetime strategy of that use of words. Or if we don't know one personally, I bet it doesn't take us long to think of someone who has made it a lifetime strategy. Then there came a time when I just wanted to be heard. And in fact, there are parts of my life that I remember as, as being characterized by feeling profoundly unheard. So I, I shifted my emphasis. I tried to find the words that others would listen to. From a desire to be safe, I had moved to a desire to be popular. Then I remember, once I knew how to be heard, wanting to be right. Not only wanting the things I said to be accurate, but wanting also to win. To be able to use words to convince or to overwhelm or to appear that I knew better what I was talking about than someone who disagreed with me. I have a friend uh, who said one time, and I remember very clearly, this was more than 20 years ago, but he said, I used to think that getting older meant, meant you were wiser. Now I understand that getting older just means you have a louder voice and a bigger vocabulary. And that was me. Using words to win, to score points, to be right. This month in our 500 days, we are following uh, the Apostle Paul, who we know directly only from uh, seven letters that survive in our New Testament. There are 13 in the New Testament that have the name of Paul attached to them. But we're only going to, if, we're reading, if you're reading along at home in the 500 days schedule, you're only going to see seven of those 13 because these seven agree with each other in vocabulary, theology, uh, grammar, rhetoric. And there's, oh, and, ecclesi and ecclesiology, which means uh, the shape and nature of the church, structure of the church. 
And the other six all disagree fundamentally with those seven on more than one of those categories. The other six have different vocabulary, different grammar, different rhetoric, different theology, and different ecclesiology. So, whoever you are, however you resolve it, you have to resolve this difference. And some people who are very strong traditionalists say something happened to Paul that dramatically changed his writing style. And others, and I'm part of this camp, say that six of the letters in our New Testament were written by people who are either trying to continue the traditions of Paul or by people who are trying to um, mimic the Apostle Paul. That's a side topic. It might be of interest to you. Paul was a persecutor of the church. We read in the book of Acts, which is a story about him, but is not, not direct, a direct source about his life, that when uh, the first Christian martyr, St. Stephen, was killed near Jerusalem, Paul watched from the sidelines uh, and approved. Then around the year 50 of our calendar, he was traveling from Jerusalem to Damascus, and had an experience of the risen Christ who said, well, called him by his Hebrew name, Saul, 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 why do you persecute me? And subsequently he was given a mission to travel the western regions of the Roman Empire, the Greek-speaking regions, which today are Turkey, Greece, Lebanon, Syria. And preach good news to non-Jews. Today's reading comes from a letter that he wrote to the church that he founded in the city of Corinth in what is now Greece. Greece. And the main characteristic of the Corinthian church that we can glean from the writings in the New Testament is that they love to argue and compete. They love to decide who is better or who is superior and inferior. They want to debate, and not only do they want to debate, they want to win. And they appealed to Paul on all sorts of matters. As sort of a a, a referee for their arguments. And Paul says, it's not about who performs the best baptism. Whether it's him or other apostles, uh, Apollos is, a, is a, another teacher that Paul mentions regularly in in the context of his letters to the Corinthians, uh, presumably a a teacher who either arose within Corinth or arrived in Corinth after Paul left and stayed, remained as a teacher in that church. He refers to uh, Cephas or Cephas, which is the Aramaic uh, equivalent of the name Peter, who was the chief apostle in Jerusalem. As though the person who baptized you conferred upon you some kind of status in the church. 
that people who were baptized by Paul or by Peter perhaps are more central to the affairs of the church than someone who is baptized by Apollos. And Paul says there's one baptism, just one. And you are baptized together, not to split yourselves apart, trying to be right, trying to win, but for the sake of the good news. The people who came together to make the church, Greek-speaking people, with experience of the Jewish synagogue, almost all of them, living within the Roman Empire, and trying to figure out what it means to be the church. Because remember I told you Paul's experience on the, on the road to Damascus was around the year 50. Paul dies in Rome in the year 67. Jesus died in Jerusalem sometime between the year 30 and 36. We're talking very, very early days. People are figuring out what it means to be church, how it looks to be church. And it can be so easy to try to win, to try to have your ideas become the predominant ideas. Paul is a bit of a controversial figure nowadays, uh, among my colleagues at least. I engage in conversations online with colleagues, and uh, I happen to be uh, a firm supporter of Paul. I, I, I like Paul. I appreciate what he does and what he says. I have colleagues who think that Paul is, uh, is, is uh, uh, not worth our time because what ended up happening with Paul's teaching is that the Roman emperor was replaced by the Holy Roman Emperor. The church became the empire. And they see that going all the way back to Paul. I disagree. I would like to fight with them. I would like to fight and win about Paul. Because here's what Paul did. Paul went to places where people were familiar with the synagogue, the Jewish faith. And the Jewish faith at the time emphasized that righteousness comes from being apart. Righteousness comes from setting oneself and one's family and one's religion as separate from both Greek and Roman influence. So through uh, circumcision, through worship at the synagogue, through refusing to enter temples of the Greek and Roman worship, refusing to participate <coughs> in uh, civil observances that required uh, adoring the Greek and Roman deities and following the Jewish dietary and uh, ritual purity laws. Keeping themselves separate leads to righteousness. And the people Paul is preaching to are people who have an admiration for the Hebrew God, a respect for the, uh, the spiritual and theological teachings, but who are unable to take that step into converting to Judaism, into setting themselves apart from the broader culture for the sake of righteousness. So they support the synagogue. They attend 
synagogue events. But for whatever reason, they find themselves unable to separate themselves, to refuse to enter non-Jewish places of worship, to refuse to eat at meals that do not follow the Jewish dietary restrictions. They have too much to lose. And Paul says to those people, because of Jesus, because Jesus because of who Jesus was, how Jesus died, and how Jesus was resurrected. You can now have righteousness separate from the synagogue. And whatever you have to do to survive, whether that means eating at uh, meals that have been consecrated to uh, Greek and Roman deities, whether it means entering Greek and Roman places of worship, whether it means rendering uh, yourself according to the Jewish uh, purity laws unclean, does not remove the righteousness that you have received in Christ through baptism. Scandal to the Jews. They've heard the messages of Roman society centered in the Latin culture of Rome. The Roman Empire prior to the Caesars, prior to Caesar Augustus, had undergone a series of devastating civil wars, one after another. Every time a civil war in the Roman Empire was resolved, the leaders on the winning side would fall out with each other and a new civil war would begin. Until finally, Augustus was victorious and was declared the savior of the world. All sorts of words that we use to refer to Jesus, Advent being one of them, Epiphany being another, today is Epiphany Sunday. These were words that were applied to Caesar Augustus, son of God, God from God, Savior of the world. And according to the messaging of the Roman Empire, the way to experience salvation was to properly venerate the emperor and to participate in Roman systems of power. in which the head of the household has absolute power over the members of the household. The head of the city has absolute power over the households of the city. The ruler of the province has absolute power over the cities of the province. And the emperor in Rome has absolute power over it all. That's what, by the way, my colleagues say Paul was part of replacing the Roman Empire with the Christian Empire. But that's not Paul's message. Paul's message is that for you, you who have experienced the brutality and neglect of the, social, of the Roman social order, which has forced you into certain relationships, forced you into certain social roles,
rendered you outcast or meaningless without recourse for justice? For you, salvation can come from Jesus Christ because of who he was, how he died, and how he was resurrected. And you can be part of a social order that does not depend on absolute authority, does not depend on venerating the emperor. You can have salvation. And in Corinth, they lived in Greece, where the predominant Greek philosophy of the time was called Stoic philosophy, or Stoicism. Stoicism, as as it still exists, teaches us that uncontrolled emotion is a destructive force in the universe. And that through properly controlling our feelings and our emotions, we can gain access, understanding of the logic that undergirds the universe. Logic, or in Greek, logos. Which in our New Testament, in the Gospel of John, is attributed as a name of Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the logic, the logos. Through controlling your emotions, you can gain understanding of the logic that undergirds the universe. And through that understanding, you will be able to make right choices, and through right choices you will gain happiness. That is the essence of Stoic philosophy. Paul says, the logic that undergirds the universe is Jesus Christ. The Stoics have it wrong. The logic that undergirds the universe is not pure reason. Reason that would have us calculate. I don't know if you've heard this recently, um, that uh, they tasked uh, uh, an artificial intelligence, I don't know which one, or what it's called, but they tasked it with saving the world. And the artificial intelligence decided that the best way to save the world was to eradicate humankind. Clearly, something is missing in its priorities, in its fundamental reasoning. But that is the kind of rational thinking that the Stoic philosophy at the time was teaching. That it is better for some to starve than for society to collapse, for example. Paul says, the logic that underlies the universe is something very different than the philosophers of this age would have you think. The logic that undergirds the universe is the way Christ lived, the way Christ died, and the way Christ was resurrected. And you can have happiness, righteousness, salvation, happiness is what Paul was offering the people.
and through it all, and this is why I don't join my colleagues in saying that Paul is more trouble than, it is, than he is worth, because through it all, this is Paul's message. It is not just the fact that Christ lived and died and was resurrected that leads us to happiness, righteousness, and salvation. It is the fact that it was done for the sake of grace and for the sake of loving kindness. When Paul says that righteousness comes not from living separate but from Christ, Paul is saying that righteousness comes from grace and loving kindness. When Paul says that salvation comes not from veneration of the emperor and his uh, uh, hierarchy of command, but from Christ, Paul is saying that salvation comes from grace and loving kindness. And when Paul says that happiness comes not from the suppression of emotion, the control of emotion, and the adherence to uh, um, uh, uh, pure reason, but salvation comes through, or happiness comes through Christ, Paul is saying that happiness comes through grace and loving kindness. When Paul says there is one baptism for the sake of the good news, he is very clear about what that good news is. The good news is that by organizing ourselves according to the fundamental realities that undergird the universe, which are grace and kindness, We can dismantle systems of brutality and domination. We can dismantle the things that separate us as humankind and keep us apart from one another. We can dismantle the ideas that say, that cruelty and competition are the natural order of things. I used to try to use my words to get what I want to feel safe. I used to use my words to become heard and become popular. I used to use my words to try to win. But I've learned and I'm learning that more important than being right more important than being popular, even more important than being safe, is being kind. And I'm trying with Paul when times of disagreement, times of difference, times of even open conflict, arise. My mission, my baptism, the responsibility that was conferred upon me is 
and upon all of us at our baptism is to spread the good news that is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. May it always be so. And Linda and Dan have uh, another hymn for us. Is it an epiphany? Oh, it's not an epiphany hymn, but it's a lovely hymn. that at the beginning of the service I didn't say what I normally say which is if you're joining us online this morning on YouTube or on Facebook uh, YouTube uh, as, a, as a later recording or live on Facebook please do let us know who you are and that you're watching in the comment section or chat section so that we can have a record of your uh, joining us during the prayers of the people this morning uh, we're invited to remember in our uh, regional council prayer circle Campbellstone United Church in Southwest Calgary their people and ministries and also the people and churches of Egypt, Israel and Palestine, Jordan and Lebanon from our World Council of Churches prayer cycle. Uh, there is a weekly email uh, circulation with the prayer concerns of our own congregation. If you would like to receive that, please let us know uh, at the office. And if you have concerns that you would like to be shared in that circle, you can email uh, pastoralcare at wildrosunited.ca. When we pray together in community, the concerns of each of us are shared by all of us. Let us pray. God, you are reaching out and touching our hearts this morning. Help us to feel your loving caress. In song, we lift our voices to celebrate your touch. 
You touch us through your word so that we can grow and mature and journey deeper in faith. In prayer, we relish your touch, welcoming your gentle embrace and sending our thanksgivings and affection in return. At the same time that we enjoy the warmth, love, and healing power of your embrace, we feel pain in the body of Christ, a trembling in our worshiping spirit, and a pang of suffering in our life together. For that reason, we pray for healing and renewal for those living with disabilities, diagnoses both new and old, and the chronic wear and tear of living in your world. We pray for those who are traveling through dark valleys shadowed by death. Excuse me. Forgive me, we had a bit of a, a, a fire situation, um, but it's under control. It was just a candle, uh, a candle that burned down and, and the flame became very, very large. So I thought I should take care of that. God, because your embrace extends far beyond us and our individual concerns, we know you hold all of creation in your tender arms. We pray therefore for those global concerns that are in need of your renewal and guidance the oceans, the forests, and ice fields, the sea, the sky, and the soil, those places that have been rocked by storm, quake, or flood, those nations, peoples, and regions that are beset by war, famine, or injustice. Here are prayers for ourselves and for the world as we worship in silence. Your embrace is our sustaining grace. Your word is the light for our journeys of faith. Your spirit is the thread of caring that binds us together. Amen. And we gather these in all our prayers, thankful that we may turn to you as to a grandmother who watches over us and pray together as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much for all of your offerings in 2021. Uh, our ministries continue in 2022, and your offerings are both uh, most welcome and most needed, are uh, on the screen and also available on the website are all of the ways that we can contribute to the ongoing ministries of Wild Rose United Church. As we contemplate our offering, Linda and Dan have an offering of music for us. Good people, this Christmas time, consider well and bear in mind what our good God for us has done in sending his beloved Son. Oh, let us all both kneel and pray to God. Christmas Day in Bethlehem that Christmas morn there was 
Let us pray. God of light, we offer these fruits of our labor and of your bounty with joyful hearts. We commit our best so that the church may offer witness to your grace and work to the benefit of the last and least. Help us to be faithful stewards of all your gifts and to walk faithfully in the light of your word. Amen. Now, if you join me in the words of the commissioning. We are called to shed God's love in the world. Let us carry a spirit of compassion with us. We are called to preach the gospel using words if necessary. May our actions speak louder than words. May Christ journey with you as you go. Let us travel together with joy and hope. Amen. Now may the God of peace equip you with all good things as you follow the call and lead you on your holy path through Jesus Christ, to whom is everlasting glory, as together we go forth. Amen. It only takes a spark to get a fire going, and soon all those around can warm up in its glowing. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you spread God's love to everyone. You want to pass it 